Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, today we have with us Professor Hermann Koppitz, who will be uh, giving us a talk on an embedded ar architecture that he has been developing. Professor Koppitz um, has been extremely active for a long time in, uh, in the embedded community, especially in fault tolerance, and uh, um, he is, his uh, venture now is being, worked, is being used by the space agency, by NASA, and that makes it a lot more interesting to us in the industry. Um, so uh, without further ado, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the possibility to talk to you about the work we have done over the past 25 years, I think. And this is the time-triggered architecture. May I structure my talk first giving you a short introduction, then introduce some basic concepts which I feel are are relevant for, for architectural work, then go into the, the core of the lecture, the time-triggered architecture by itself, talk a little bit about time-triggered protocols which you find on the market now, like TTP, FlexRate, TTCAN, and TTE Ethernet. And then if we have time, we can talk about fault tolerance in the TTA because fault tolerance is a, a key element of the architecture and finally come to some conclusion. Now, I am very happy if you interrupt me in the talk. It should be an, an open discussion, and, and if some things are not clear, please feel free to ask. Now, what is a system architecture? Well, a system architecture, we consider it as a framework to construct systems, and hopefully, if it's a good framework, the systems will be understandable, maintainable, extensible, and can be built cost-effectively. But the important verb I consider on this slide is the word constraints. And architecture is constraining. And an ideal good architecture would only let you build good systems and not, no bad systems. That's one aspect. The other thing is that if you architecture a system from the point of view of low level performance and efficiency, you will probably have to make some sacrifices. The structure which is imposed by an architecture causes a certain amount of, of of performance constraints and, and performance degradations, and you must be willing to do it. And what you gain for it are, as I said, understandability, maintainability. So the point being, if you build a system unstructured with spaghetti code, if you're really clever, you probably can build it more efficient than the system which is architectured. Now, what is characteristic for an architecture? We consider the architectural style, that are the rules and the guidelines for partitioning of a system into components. And the key issue is here complexity management. It should be built, able to build components together to construct a system out of components at a higher abstraction level as what we are doing at, at let's say, at, at the object-oriented world. We want to make the interfaces well specified it and want the interfaces to match so that we can avoid property mismatches at the interfaces and we don't need any glue between different parts of the systems designed by different organizations. And finally, I think there's also an aesthetic element in a good architecture, which is very difficult to quantify in engineering terms. It's an, it's an element of elegance. You look at something like a, a medieval church or something and you say, this is an elegant building. And there's some element of elegance also in the architecture. But the key issue in any kind of architecture is the interface. And interface design and architecture design are very closely related with each other. Now, if you give you an overview of our architecture, the time-triggered architecture, what are the goals? We wanted to, to develop an integrated cross-domain architecture for the design of multi-criticality dependable systems. By multi-criticality dependable systems, we mean that some applications are highly critical, for example, in a car, the braking system is a highly critical application, and you really want that the brake work, even if you run a special multi multimedia application in your car. So you want to have applications of different criticality in the architecture, and they should be able to coexist. Second, we wanted to lift the design abstractions to a higher level. 
And this level is we think about systems in the form of components and messages. We do not want to think so much in threads or in, in APIs or anything. Our interfaces are message interfaces and our computational units are components. And as I will explain in a minute, components are hardware software unit, which implements, so to speak, a state machine. And very much in, of interest to us is the support for the composition of system out of components. And this is what we call composability. We wanted to implement fault tolerance transparently in the architecture. So if a component is very critical, we want to be able to replicate the component three times. We have three components doing the same thing on three different hardware units. And then we can vote on the results and can mask the failure of a single component. This is called triple modular redundancy. And furthermore, we want to also address the problem of technology obsolescence. What we learned from industry is that software is much more long-lived than hardware. If you take an Airbus as an example, their software systems have to live for 60 years from the A320, from the first start until they will stop maintaining and the hardware changes every four years. So we have to look into this problem of technology obsolescence from the architectural point of view. Let me give you a few a few, a few words on the history of, of the architecture. We started out on this project about 30 years ago. So you see, it's a lifetime project in a sense. And about if you sum all the money which has been invested in this architecture, it's in the order of, of a, probably more than $100 million. We founded in 1998 a spin-off company of the TU Vienna, TT Tech, which is now bringing the architecture to industry. And we have had quite a few, for us at least, very challenging applications. The first one was in railway signaling. This was an application done in Austria for, from Thales, at the time Alcatel. Then we have aerospace application done with, with Honeywell, with Boeing and with Airbus. And our architecture is being used in the Boeing 787, in the onboard electronic systems. There are about 70 TTP nodes in there. In automotive systems, this architecture will be used in the new cars from Audi, the new A8 and, and the A6, and it's being used in, in the BMW. And other companies are already following, but I'm not allowed to talk about that because this is still confidential. And then what is very, what was very happy we're about to hear that the NASA has decided to use the basic time-triggered Ethernet, which we have developed, which is a core element of the architecture in the new Orion uh, successor of the space shuttle. Furthermore, the TTR, the time ticket architecture is, so to speak, the starting of a, of a European project and which we are working on, which is called Genesis, Generic Embedded System Architecture, where a number of major European players have formed a consortium funded by the European Commission in Brussels to develop a cross-domain architecture for embedded systems all over, uh, for all over Europe. Now, let me come to some important concepts which I have to introduce in order to understand our, <laughs> our work better. The first concept that I want to introduce is a distributed application subsystem, and we call it a DAS. What is a distributed application subsystem? The best way to explain it is by examples. And I will take the example of automotive electronics. If you do look at the control system in a car, you have 50, 60, 70 different computers, and they can be structured according to different distributed application subsystems. For example, the red ones are safety relevant. For example, the vehicle dynamics, you control the suspension, the braking system, the engine control system, then the multimedia system, the airbag system, the climate control system. They are all distributed subsystems in a car that communicate to some extent, but are basically developed in isolation by different organizations. For example, the braking system might be developed by Conti and the engine control system by Bosch. And so they develop their own hardware software unit, which results in these many different computational elements and, and boxes in the architecture. Now, if every one of these DASIs has its own hardware, say, its own hardware base and it's developed independently of the other DASIs, then we come to what is called the federated architecture, which has advantages. The federated architecture has clear responsibility, clear fault isolation and error containment. 
but it has limited sharing of hardware resources, it has a lot of wires and a lot of boxes, which is very expensive. To give you an example from the automotive industry, you see how the number of boxes in cars has grown over the last 10 years in the, in the different companies, uh, European companies are here, BMW, Daimler, Chrysler, Audi and VW, and they all go now 45, 50, as I said, in some premium models, you go up to 70 different computers. And this is very expensive and we're getting a lot of wires and boxes in the cars to an extent they don't know where to put them, you know, under the roof, a number of them and in the side panels and so on. And to have fewer boxes and fewer wires would also help the dependability of the whole thing because about 30% of the failures are contact failures and if you reduce the number of wires, you reduce the number of failures. But the reason why they cannot integrate it because present day computer architectures do not have a clean concept for fault isolation and error uh, propagation boundaries in the architecture. So it would be nice to integrate, to have different subsystems on the same hardware, on the same wires, but in order to do that you need to maintain the independence of the different DASs. It might not be that one DAS, for example, the multimedia DAS influences another DAS, which might be the engine control, that when you hear a lot of, of strong beats on the multimedia, the engine starts to stutter. You must make sure also from the point of view of complexity and diagnostics that faults can be isolated to the, to the reason, to the cause very easily. And of course in an integrated architecture this allocation is more difficult. So fault isolation and error propagation are the critical issues in an integrated architecture. Now, in a modern driven design approach, we can implement a high level specification of the components and for example, in this Genesis project, all partners from the very, very safety relevant aviation industry and automotive industry over to the, to the mobile phone industry like Nokia, all agreed that they will use a uni uniform specification formalism, which is UML MATE. And then we develop a platform independent model, which is a behavioral model in a high level language. It could be, for example, in SRL or it could be in System C or in whatever other specification, MATLAB Simulink. And then you can implement a component in different implementation technologies and I already mentioned it could be implemented in software on a CPU, it could be implemented in an FPGA block or it could be implemented in an ASIC. All these different implementations should have the same low level, well, the low level because it's on the, on the bottom of the screen, the LIF interface as, as introduced before. What is important is that the non-functional characteristics of these different implementations can be substantially different. I've given here a, a foil which goes back to iMac and they look at the energy performance, the energy efficiency of different implementations in ASIC, FPGA and, and CPU and they consider that the, an FPGA implementation will be 100% more, 100 times more energy efficient than a CPU implementation and an ASIC another 10. So by moving, for example, a cryptographic algorithm which is used in many components into hardware, into ASIC, you can save uh, a lot of energy, which is important, of course, for, for mobile devices. If on a CPU implementation it takes one hour, the energy load to deplete the energy, you could live with the same energy load on an ASIC for 1,000 hours, and that makes a substantial difference. And so that's what I mean, this flexibility to implement components in different technology makes a lot of sense from the energy point of view, from the silicon area point of view and from other non-functional properties. Now when we integrate components in the architecture we are concerned which what we call the composability and we have identified four principles of composability. The first one we already discussed we must have a complete specification of the component interfaces in the domain of value and time and of course at the operational level and at the meta level in order to be able to develop components in isolation. Otherwise we cannot develop the component if we don't have a specification. The next one relates to the component implementation and integration. When we integrate components into a system, 
we must make sure that the prior services of the component, that means those services which have happened before the integration, remain intact after the integration. That the integration doesn't violate any of the component services. We want non-interfering interactions. That means the communication system, the transport messages, must meet the given temporary requirements under all uh, specified operating conditions. And we want to preserve the component abstraction in the case of failures. That means we want to be able to reason about the system behavior even if components fail at the same level of abstractions as in a non-failing system. That we don't have to break the abstractions when it comes down to component failures. Now, let me go back to the principle number three, the non-interfering interactions, because I think this is really a, a key principle of the architecture. And when I mentioned that the slide on the component was the first important slide, this is the second one. And what does this slide say? If I have two DASs, the green DAS and the red DAS, and they share a communication system, I would like to keep these two DASs also separate in the communication. I don't want to throw the dice or the roulette. And most communication systems nowadays are on the left side. And what we would like to see is we would like to have a clean separation of subsystems even after the integration. And this means we come to a very disciplined way of separating the bandwidth and this is what is the time-triggered approach. Now, we have are carrying out this principle down to the chip level. And we are now working on a project to de develop, actually we already have developed a prototype of a time-triggered network on chips. Because we feel if we do lose this cleanly, clean structure at the chip level, it will be very difficult to recover at higher levels of abstraction. I mean, you could recover, but this is a lot of extra effort you have to put into the software and into the system. So the basic architecture is a deterministic architecture, which has a clean separation of subsystems. And this gives us a very, very nice basic structure to build complex systems out of simple components and to build for tolerant systems. The basic communication facility in the architecture that we have implemented in the TTA is a, is a time-triggered, unicast message service. It's only in one direction and not in the other direction. And why we only provide unicast services and not bidirectional services, I will explain later when it comes to the fault tolerance. So let me now come to the principles of the TTA. Did you know some concepts? The, some ideas, and first of all, we say that every component which we have introduced must be time aware. And we support in the TTA a special model of time which is called the sparse time, which maybe I could explain right here. The sparse time model means that we partition the continuum of time in intervals of activity and silence, as shown in this picture. And events which are under the control of the system may only be executed in an interval of activity in the green interval and not in the other interval, in the red interval. And the red interval must be sufficiently wide apart from the green interval and this, the size depends on the precision of the clock synchronization. In, it must be at least 3 pi when pi is the precision. And we now have the possibility to represent time in the form of integers, where every of these pi intervals gets one integer value. And we can establish the temporal order of events by comparing the timestamps of integers. And this is consistent within the distributed system. This problem of, of consistent temporal order is, I would say, another <laughs> fundamental problem in, in, in distributed systems. And if we do not have consistent temporal order, we cannot order messages consistently in a distributed system and we lose the determinism. So this past time model is a prerequisite for the deterministic operation of the system. So the next point says that actions are triggered by the progression of time. And the basic notion in the architecture is the notion of a cycle, which tells me how 
long does it take to come back to this point of sending another message? And this is the duration of the cycle. And then the phase of the cycle is the offset of the cycle start from some time reference, from our global time reference. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The next one is we partition the system into independent fault containment units. And we must make sure that an FCU can fail in an arbitrary failure mode without having an effect on the other glasses and the other fault containment units that are not directly depending on it. Of course, if it sends you a wrong message, you have to handle it at application level. It wants to be a platform architecture. That means we want to distinguish between core services and higher level services. One basic service at the core level is a membership service that tells every node about the health state of the other nodes of the system and the validity of the fault hypothesis. We will come back to this later when we talk about fault tolerance. And we make the closed world assumption for the hard real-time services and resolve resource conflicts a priori by design. And of course, this can be done dynamically on the fly, but it still has to be resolved by design a priori in, in before the runtime. Give you an example of an architecture from the automotive domain. You have the communication system and the different subsystems and the communication system is controlled by a time division multiple access access scheme. Talked about that one already. Now let's say a little bit about the control systems because as I said we are in embedded systems and embedded control and so it's important to map the architecture to the requirements of the domain. And many control systems are cyclic or periodic. And at, on this slide, you find two representations of time. One is the linear time and one is the cyclic time. And we feel that the cyclic time representation is much better for, for a control system because it gives you this, this, this uh, periodic structure. It represents it in a much better way. And so you can see here in the cyclic time, we have we'll be reading the sensor data, transporting the sensor data, doing the control algorithm, transporting the set points and doing the output action. And in the last part, the, we have still some free time and we can use this time to distribute the ground state and vote on the ground state to recover the system or a component in case one of them has failed. So as I said, we, we consider the cycle defined by period and phase as a very basic element of the architecture and, and think a lot when we reason about the architecture in, in the notions of cycles, much more so than in notions of, of, of deadlines. The time format we have introduced has been standardized by the OMG and it's actually the same time format that is used also by the IEEE 1588 standard and is closely related to the GPS time. We use in the time trigger architecture a time format of eight bytes, which gives us a resolution of two to the minus 24 seconds to two to the 40 second. At the one end, it's 60 nanoseconds. At the other end, is about 30,000 years, which should be enough not to worry about a <laughs> wrap around problem at the end. What is interesting in this time format is it's a binary time format, and the full second is, is clearly identified. And this is very helpful if you want to synchronize a time with other time standards because you normally get a full second tick and it's easy to synchronize. We further made the distinction or the restriction actually that we will basically support, which mean, is not a, a hard rule, but whenever you, you have the freedom to do it, we should look at, at cycles which are binary fractions or binary multiples of the second that you have a cycle which is half a second, a quarter second, and so on. To generalize it, it doesn't have to be the second. It could be any kind of time reference that you want to have. For example, in multimedia system, it might be something different. But we do not want to have cycles which are primed to each other, because this would make scheduling very difficult in an architecture. Now, in the network on chip that we have designed, we need to go further down than to the two to the minus 24 seconds, but that's no problem. You can just add to the right. And as a matter of fact, you can always take out the part of this, of this time representation if you are happy with a limited horizon and the limited granularity. So you can support a 16-bit time format or a 32-bit time format. This is very flexible here. If you've done it properly, you can 
rebuild and, and, and analyze it easily. We use in a, in a time period architecture a lot of the timing information, a priori information to provide special services. For example, here we have the error detection service used, uses the time for the membership. In the TDP protocol, we also use the time for message identification, so we don't need any message names because message is identified by the time. We use it for, for flow control and so on. And we overcome some of the fundamental limits in asynchronous architectures in, from the point of view of fault containment, because in an asynchronous architecture, you cannot distinguish between a slow node and a failed node. And that's a fundamental limit. So if, if you really want to put fault tolerance and error detection into the architecture, you must overcome this limit and the time triggered architecture does it for you. So let me summarize now. We introduced four basic elements in the architecture. The interface, which is a data sharing boundary between two communicating subsystems. And we introduced the LIF interface here as an example, but also the local interface, which is, as I said, not specified as an architecture level. We provide a time trigger communication system. We provide a host computer that reads input data, produces output data, and has an internal state, which we want to make visible at the reintegration point. And then we have transducers, which transform data from some other system or from an interface into the reform required in the architecture and vice versa. Here a picture of the platform character of the architecture. We have core services. The core services are predictable transmission of messages, fault tolerant clock synchronization, fault isolation, determinism, and membership service. And then we have higher level services, encapsulation service, event triggered communication, virtual channel, hidden gateways, legacy interfaces, diagnostic support. And then we have, of course, different application subsystems which I've introduced before. In the Genesis project, we even went a step further and we introduced different cores for different application domains. For example, application domain A will have another core at the higher level, which might be a multimedia core, and uh, this could be for, for mobile phones. And the uh, safety critical system might have another basic core at the left side, which again can be expanded to higher level services as needed by the application and by the middleware services. At least you hear some of the cross-domain services with which we have identified which are being considered in the architecture. I would like to point out that one particular service is security layer. We find out security is a typical cross-domain concern. You have the same kind of security issues in mobile phones as you have them in safety critical systems, in automotive systems. And it makes a lot of sense to build a hardware component for encryption and decryption and make it as a hardware chip, so to speak, or hardware IP core, and then you save a lot of energy and make sure that everybody uses the same generic mechanisms here. Of course, dynamic configuration service is another service we are looking into, which you want to, if you want to tolerate permanent failures for transient failures, which are the majority of failures, the restart service the, is enough to handle the transient failures. Now, why don't we take the cell processor as a basic element of the time trigger architecture. We have looked at it very closely because it has many properties that we like very much, but one property is missing on the cell, and that's the predictable communication system. And if you look at the difference between the cell and the time triggered system on chip that we are devising, it's, it's coming from two different ends. The cell processor is designed to run a single monolithic application and partition it uh, onto the, on dependent cores. The TTSOC is designed to provide an execution environment for nearly independent jobs from different DASIs. And that's quite a different starting point we're having here. Fault isolation and error containment between the jobs are the key issues in, in the time trigger architecture and in the cell processor. The decomposition of the application into parallel modules is the, is the key issue. The communication system on the cell is an asynchronous on chip communication, which does not provide the kind of independence that we would like to see in a time triggered architecture. So that's a different view. And the software side on the cell, we can have a single distributed operating system, which does all the task allocation and, and threat management and so on. 
But on the DTSOC, we could have multiple operating systems. We could have a different operating system within any of the IP cores. So the whole issue of, of central operating system and central middleware disappears to a certain extent. It's taken over by the, by the time-triggered network on chip, and then, of course, we have to have some mechanisms to dynamically allocate this time-triggered network. And this is done here. Um, it gives you an example of, of a TT SOC chip. We have here a resource manager, which does the dynamic allocation of bandwidth resources. We have a number of different IP cores, which could be a DSP engine, an FPGA fabric, or a CPU. And then we have some general services, like an external memory manager, a diagnostic core. I haven't uh, shown on this picture a security service. But what we see is that, that such a DT system on chip would consist of generic components that could be implemented in, in hardware, in ASICs, and programmable components which could be either FPGA or CPUs. And this is what we call the, the, the composable MP. So each IP core can host a job, a former ACU of a DAS, as you saw it before. The time trigger network of chip gives you this independence and provides a predictable message transfer service. The Trusted Network Authority, this resource controller, which I mentioned on the previous chip, supports dynamic bandwidth allocation in the SOC. And in the implementation we have now, a reassignment of bandwidth can be done within 30, 40 milliseconds or so on, that you really can do it on the fly. And we have a diagnostic core that collects an analysis, diagnostic and security information, and performs online analysis. This is a prototype, the first prototype which was done with Standard CPUs and the second prototype is now done on an FPGA, which we already finished the second prototype of it. Okay, so this is the first part, giving you an overview of the time trigger architecture. And before going into the second part, where I talk about the time trigger protocols, maybe if you have any questions to this first part, I'm very happy to entertain them at the moment. Um, do you require now to have only one entry point into the network, or can you have multi-hosted? We can multi-hosted. I mean, the local interface is un unspecified, and you could have whatever you don't want. The, the, this is intentionally unspecified. And the reason why we didn't want to specify that because there are many different application domains who have their own protocol standards. For example, the MIPI standard in the domain of, of, of multimedia systems in the, in the mobile phone area is one of them. The, uh, TCP and P is another one in the, in, in the internet, of course, and so we want to be able to adapt the architecture to all these different standards rather easily, and, and the best way is not to standardize on, on this point. Standardize the other side. Okay, let me go now back to the communication protocol, because that's the work where we really have done quite a bit of, where we have done quite a bit of research over the past 30 years. We have developed originally, this was already 20 years ago, or close to 20 years ago, the time trigger protocol, which was the first one. And then later on, there was a version of the time trigger protocol elemented in CAN, which is called TT CAN. The automotive industry, they wanted to have also more event triggered services and to develop their own protocol based on TTP, which is the flex rate protocol. And we have developed lately a time-triggered protocol on the Ethernet basis, which is completely compatible with standard Ethernet, which we call the time-triggered Ethernet. And let me go a little bit over these protocols, what are their characteristics. TTPC, as I said, was the first one. We developed here the protocol to generate a fault-tolerant global time base. So the protocol is an integrated, distributed fault-tolerant clock synchronization algorithm. It is now implemented with up to 25 megabits per second, and it's used quite heavily in the aerospace domain. It's used on the Airbus A380, it's used on the Boeing 787, it's used on the F-16, and some other aerospace projects, they use TTP. The media access is controlled by TDMA, and if you want event-triggered messages, they are piggybacked on the basic time-triggered messages. The information is identified by the common knowledge of the send receive times. We support in TTP variable message sizes. You can implement fault tolerance systems with two independent intelligent star couplers that you get full fault tolerance and, and no critical point of failure in a, in a safety critical application. 
And the membership service is implemented also in the hardware to detect crash or mission failures and also to detect violations of the fault hypothesis. I'm coming to that in a minute when I talk about fault tolerance. Flexray is also a time-triggered protocol, very similar to DP in the, in the time-triggered part, but the, in addition they have an event-triggered part, which is, so to speak, added to the time-triggered part, where they use the mini-slotting media access strategy implemented in the RX629 protocol originally. The bandwidth up to now is 10 megabits per second. It has a constant message size, and it's used in the automotive industry. And the first products with the FlexRay protocol that you are already on the market, the first one is, is a, a small version of, well, the car is not small, but only small functions are supported in, in the BMW, which came out last year, I think. But the next big introduction of FlexRay will be in 2009 by Audi on the new A8 and by BMW on the new seven series cars. And then it will move all down the hierarchy in the Volkswagen Group to the Volkswagen Passat and Golf and, and all cars. So it's, it's, and there, there are other companies in, in Europe and Japan who are also doing work on flex rate at the moment. Now TT-CAN is an extension of the CAN protocol. It's an automotive protocol that's widely used at the moment. There are hundreds of millions CAN controllers in use in cars. It has a central master clock synchronization. As I said, TTP and FlexRay have a fault tolerant clock synchronization, which is distributed. They support time triggered and event triggered message that is similar to FlexRay. It goes up to one megabit per second, and the message size is according to the CAN format. Now, the last protocol, which I'm going to go a little bit more in detail, is the TT Ethernet protocol, because I think it's, it's something to speak to. Well, we have developed it, and so we're very it's our baby and so I want to explain it a bit more detail because I think it takes advantage of the experience we have had over all these protocol developments over the last 20 years. And we try to put all the good things in there and don't put the bad things in there. So it's a very flexible protocol. So the basic idea of TT Ethernet is that we say if you want to guarantee timing, you need a closed world. In an open world, timing cannot be guaranteed. So we introduced two types of messages, the standard Ethernet messages with the standard Ethernet format, we call them ET messages, and the time-triggered messages. And they are scheduled, there is the closed word assumption, and they are guaranteed for latency and jitter and they are deterministic. Now what do we do if the two messages come together? Okay, that's the key issue. First of all, we have to detect the two messages, if it's one or the other. And we detect this, and this is done by the switch, so it's for switched Ethernet, it's not the bus system, it's for, for switched Ethernet system, but most Ethernet switches today are switched. We went to the IEEE to get a special tag type field for time-triggered messages. And this tag type field is 887. So if the message, and this is unique in all over the world because the IEEE standard authority has given it to us, so if the switch finds out that the tag type field is 887, it knows it's a time triggered message. Now, what does it do? Well, the idea here is very easy. We preempt the event triggered message. It means if an event triggered message is in progress, it's stopped. Forget about it. The time triggered message goes through the switch with a constant delay and minimal jitter, and then the switch autonomously resends the event triggered message because it knows that the message has been stopped and it has the message in its store. So the user only sees an extension of the time triggered delay, but this is no problem because the Ethernet doesn't guarantee, the normal Ethernet doesn't guarantee any temporary properties anyway. So we can handle the two traffic types, TT versus ET, the DT is preempted, TT versus TT, that's a failure because the TT should, must be scheduled, it must be free of conflict. And ET versus ET, well, that's one has to wait until the other is finished. And that's the standard Ethernet policy. There's no, no change here. And there's no guarantee for timeliness and determinism for ET messages anyway. So we don't give, cannot give it either. It's only for the TT messages that we guarantee timeliness and determinism. So, so TT messages are scheduled and are free of conflict. We know that the switch will need a certain time to preempt and the message. 
And so we have this constant time implemented for all messages in the switch at this time in our implementation, which is a 100 megabit implementation, is about three microseconds. So the switch puts a three microseconds delay in there, but the jitter is only about 500 nanoseconds. And of course, the jitter is the key thing for all the, the clock synchronization and so on. So we can synchronize clocks on the 100 megabit Ethernet with DT Ethernet to better than a microsecond. And this is also, the whole thing has also been applied for a patent, and we got a European patent on this whole DT Ethernet issue. And this is what was, was really, to us, one of the highlights. And this is a press release from Honeywell from April 2008, not too long ago, that our spin-off company that we formed about 10 years ago, which is DT Tech, that they decided to propose to, to the NASA the, the TT Ethernet, and, and they, they gave this press release out uh, two months ago, and, and I think this is a very positive sign. Now, we would like, of course, to bring TT Ethernet, in, uh, well, TT Tech would like, but we would like to, into the mass market, but this has to be done very carefully and with, with a lot of care, because you don't want to come out with something in the, uh, too early, which is not well thought out. But we are now, very much assured by this decision, this, de this decision of, of NASA that we are at the right point technically. Because they have looked at all possible protocols around and all kinds of systems and they found out this is the best one because it gives you the determinism and so on. So we now have a solution for the highest end and this is going to, to gigabit this season. It's actually already gigabit switches built and, and delivered to NASA and so on. So this is at the high end. But of course, interesting is then going to the low end, but it, it's much easier to bring a high-end solution to the low end if you know it works at the high end than the other way around, that you start at the low end and you don't know if it will work at the high end. So we can configure a TT Ethernet switch, as I said here, with standard Ethernet controllers, where the TT Ethernet protocol is put in software, or we can use special hardware Ethernet controllers, which do have clock synchronization, and of course then we can get a better temporary resolution. But one of the ideas of TT Ethernet is that the exact time of sending a message into the network is controlled not by the end system but by the switch. And by this we don't require a very high precision of the end system. The end system just has to send the message before the, the deadline, but it doesn't matter if there's a jitter of 50 or 100 microseconds in it. The switch will send the message into the network at the pri precise point in time, which is down to the microsecond precise. So we get a very clean system. And if you have hardware controllers, of course, you can do it better. We are not talking with some semiconductor companies that they put the hardware facility into the, 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 the silicon so that we can get a very pre precise precision. And there's some very positive movement in the community, which is the IEEE 5088 standard, which already uses established standard for clock synchronization, and the TT Ethernet is compatible with IEEE 1588, so we can use the IEEE 1588 hardware to implement the TT Ethernet controller, and we don't have to redesign anything in the chips in there, because it's only the clock synchronization that is important. And of course, you can use software-implemented systems. There is no change whatsoever in the hardware. The only thing is that you do it in the driver, and there are also some systems being designed now and built for, with, with software implemented. Of course, then the clock synchronization is not as good as in a hardware system. You get about 50 microseconds clock synchronization precision in the hardware system, and you go down to one microsecond. Okay, that's about TT Ethernet. As I said, that's some baby which we are really very, very proud of and hope that it, it will have a grow up and be a bright future. How much time do I have left? Okay, so I, if you are, you're willing to go on listening, I can tell you some more about the fault tolerance in the whole time period architecture because that was one of the key issues and it's a, it's a bit separate. Let me summarize what I've said. Now we want to implement safety critical systems. So that means you want to be able to build systems where any single failure in hardware or software can be tolerated. And we can have no point in the system, the failure of which can cause the system to fail. So the first issue is we have to establish a fault-tolerant global time base. And we know from COE that if we want to build fault-tolerant clock synchronization, we need at least four nodes. That's the Byzantine argument. So we need at least four nodes in a fault-tolerant cluster to build up a fault-tolerant time base. And then we can handle one arbitrary node failure. 
a node forms a fault containment region. It's hardly a blow software, but I must say a node in that sense could be also an IP core, but I will talk about that later on on an, on an MP SOC, but with, re with restricted uh, with restricted fault tolerance capabilities. A single node can fail in an arbitrary failure node. We make no assumptions about the node failure, which makes it very nice for testing and diagnosis. We provide a bus guardian in the switch, in the TTEs in the switch. You can extend it to provide fault tolerance in it. This has already been done. So that and the assumption is that the communication channel, the guardian, can also fail in an arbitrary failure node, but it cannot produce syntactically correct message out of nothing. That's one of the assumptions we have to make. Otherwise, you would have to have three uh, guardians, but this is an assumption which can be substantiated. We can isolate a fault tolerant, a faulty node after two DDMA rounds, even if it shows Byzantine behavior. But we cannot isolate it in 2 DMA on startup. Startup is a, is a real issue, fault tolerant startup. You mean you start up the system and somebody is in the system who really tries to interfere with the startup. We have now also a proven algorithm for that, but it needs some 20 rounds of communication for a fault tolerant startup. And after transient loss of all communication capabilities, because of a massive EMI attack, the system will recover within a bounded number of rounds. So the approach to safety in the, in the TTA is what we call the Swiss cheese model. This is not something we invented, it goes back to reason. And it says you don't want to put all your back eggs in one basket. So you have the first the normal operation and hope everything will work fine. In case it doesn't, we have support on-chip DMR, but on-chip DMR has also a problem of, of power supply and earthing and so on being a common mode of failure. So in a really safety critical system, we have to support off-chip DMR. And if the off-chip DMR fails for whatever reason, then we still have to go back and have a never give up strategy that we can recover. So we have four levels of safety, so to speak. And as I said, this multiple layer of defenses is, is typical for any safety critical architecture. So let me go a little bit into TMR, which from the previous picture is a really fundamental issue in a time triggered architecture. Let's assume I have the green and the red node. They control the valve to the red side, and I have a non redundant system with two nodes and the built TMR in there. Then all of a sudden, nodes multiply. I get the three nodes for B, three nodes of C, three actuators, and of course, I need the sensors. And of course, this is quite a bit additional hardware but it's justified in safety critical applications. When you go to by wire or the body functions where you don't have any mechanical backup, they would have to go to this and it's done in airplanes. You find a lot of these architectures here. The question is, what do you need to do it? And the first one I would like to say, to say why you need determinism. Let's assume you have a takeoff from an airplane and you control the speed well, you, you decide based on the speed of the plane if, to, if you take off or if you abandon the takeoff. And you have two channels, and channel one says take off, and channel two says abort. The question is who is right and who is wrong in such a situation. Both could be right. And if you look at it, but this is a hypothetical example, but it, it brings the point across. If you assume that the two channels use different crystals, different clocks, could very well be that the timeout on channel one is a little bit different than the timeout on channel two. And because the one is earlier, it finds the speed below the critical takeoff speed. The other one, which is later, defines the speed above the critical takeoff speed. And the two channels come to different conclusions, both of them correct. Both of them are correct from their point of view, but they are not replica deterministic. Now let's assume the third channel fails and it says take off and stop the engine, which because it's, it's evidently faulty. Who will win if we do a voting? The third channel will win. Now the reason why I'm bringing this is to show you that if we lose replica determinism, 
we lose the fault tolerance capability of the system. So the system must be replica determinate if we want to maintain fault tolerance in the system. That's just the, the so what else is needed to implement DMR? I talk already about the replica deterministic operation. I need to have independent fault containment regions. The system must be independent. I need independent communication channel. I need a synchronization infrastructure because if I don't have the fault tolerance synchronization, I would need four. I couldn't do it with DMR. I need a predictable multicasting communication and the support for voting. Now, a lot of this lower things is already implemented in the, in the TTA architecture, in, in the TT Senate system and the TTP system. Now, what is determinism? And I give you here a bit of more formal definition of determinism and say what is, is relevant of this definition that it includes time. And I feel in, in physical embedded systems, a definition of determinism which does not include time is incomplete. Because determinism is a phenomena in, 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 in physics where time is part of the whole thing. I do something now, but I want to know something will be done later on. This is this, this entailment condition that given I know the state now, and given I know all future inputs and the times, then I can accurately predict what will happen in the system. It's a determinism. This is what we must guarantee. Let me give you another difficult example here. I have my three communication channels, one, two, and three. And in, on the example before, it sends the red message on the green message on the two channels. And we have simultaneity. Now, in, in this case here, everything is fine. All the, the red and the green are temporarily ordered, and we get the voter gets three green messages and three red messages, all of them the same. Everything is fine. But what happens if we have simultaneity here? If the red one and the green one come simultaneous, and the channels are independent, as I mentioned before, then it could very well be that the one channel says, take one red before the green, and the other one says, take green before the red, and then they have an inconsistent temporal order, and the voter doesn't know what to do. So we have again lost our, our redundancy. So the issue here is that one channel is free to determine which should be taken, and the other one must do the same thing. And that's a bit of magic. And the actually two problems is to, to determine are they simultaneous and what to do if they are simultaneous. Now then the problem, what to do if they are simultaneous is easy, because I could always say the green one should be before the red one. And if everybody does it, that's fine. So the, the key issue is that they can determine if they are simultaneous. And in order to do that, I need the sparse time base. If I don't have the sparse time base in the system, I cannot solve the problem. And so we are now back to a very, I think, a fundamental problem in computer science, which is the ordering of simultaneous messages. And it's again the simultaneity problem, which hardware people know from the metastability problem which operating system knows from the mutual exclusion problem and which distributed system people know from the message ordering problem. It's all the same problem, it's simultaneity. And if you can handle the simultaneity cleanly in an architecture, then we solve the problem. There are two solutions, distributed consensus, which is a very complicated solution, which is done in some of the atomic broadcast protocols, but which also is in conflict with the real-time requirement and with the independence. And the other one is the sparse time solution, which is the much easier and simpler solution, which we implemented in the architecture. So we talked about it. Now let's go how we handle errors on our system on chip. As I said, we have a hard core of the chip. This is the Trusted Network Authority and Trusted Interface Subsystems, which determine when a node is allowed to send. And a component is not allowed to determine its sending point, only the DNA is allowed to write the sending points into the TIS. That means an arbitrary failing component cannot destroy the communication logic. We have here a system consisting of on-chip DMR, and we can do the voting here in the nodes, and we thus can handle transient failures in the node within an architecture, and they can make the other nodes. Input. But this is only good if I want to have to high dependability but not a safety critical system because there's a certain level of probability that the whole chip will fail and this will not cover this. So we can go to off-chip DMR 
And this is the example where we have off-chip DMI in this architecture, where we connect the chips with DT Ethernet and get then complete independence as far as the standards require it. So we can tolerate a node failure and we can tolerate a uh, switch failure. And we can also use the same architecture, for example, for multimedia systems, where we have streaming applications in this architecture. So this brings us back to my final slides, that this DTA has been the basis, or is the basis for a new project which we are doing for the, in, in Europe with the financing of the Commission, which takes up the requirements from the Artemis Consortium and builds a European reference architecture for embedded systems going out from the DTA. And this is via the coordinators, Nokia, Infineon, Thales, ST Microelectronic, NXP, Fiat, Volvo, DTTEC, Ikalan, IMEC, and many others are part of this project, uh, altogether 23 partners. And we have a project duration from January 8, June 2009. We already agreed on the architectural style, and we are now going into the definition of the architectural services. And these are the key challenges of Artemis, which are addressed by this architecture. This was the two-year work of a number of companies considering the domain of embedded systems to look what they consider are the key issues in this domain. It's composability, networking and security, robustness, diagnostic and maintenance, integrated resource management, evolvability and self-organization. Now, there's, if you go with Artemis on the web, you find a detailed report, which is about 60, 70 pages, going in much more detail on these issues. So this brings me to the final conclusion. What is the conclusion? Well, first of all, physical time is always present if we use it or if we don't use it. And if we use it, we can make a lot of problems simpler than if we don't use it. So we consider physical time to be part of the solution domain and not part of the problem domain. Many people think it makes things more difficult if we have time, but we think it makes it easier if we have time. That's one of the conclusions. And I think the second one is the difficult problems, Sebastian, determinism, are much easier to handle if you have a clean notion of time than if you have not. So the message is take the advantage of the time which all, uh, hits everybody at the same rate. We're all getting older by one second per second and take advantage of it and use it to make your problem simpler and more understandable. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I have a quick one. Well, for example, on, on, on that example that you put very nicely about the messages sent to the airplane, if it should take off or not to take off, um, I think, as you're saying, if you put time as part of the message, so that the decision has to be based on a specified velocity at a particular time, not just the value thing, then that, that could solve that kind of issue. Yes, right? that's just the point. You know, it's a hypothetical example, but I just wanted to get the message across that if you lose determinism, you lose your fault tolerance capability, even if the subsystems are both correct. Because both subsystems are correct. I mean, if the one says stop and the other one says go, I mean, if this is in a dense time base, it can always happen. And, 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 time, and of course, this past time solves it in a very clean way because you have now a consistent notion of time. And you get, to, of course, you have to agree on the input data as well consistently, that you have to have a consensus protocol. But then everything is straightforward and can be generalized in the architecture and not in the application. about self-organization, meaning you said many times that uh, the systems are closed, um, that there is a priori knowledge of scheduling. So how do we insert something into an existing system? What do we need to know? Well, I think that the issue of self-organization is, is, has been discussed here in, 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 in the Artemis uh, project, and I think it, it, it's very much brought in from the mobile phone community. Nokia is very keen on, on this issue. We ourselves have not done so much work on safe organization because we have done more work in the area of safety critical systems and in this system you do want to know everything a priori and everything is fixed. 
But when you go to the Ethernet, we have realized that this safety critical, where everything is fixed, is only a small domain of the embedded system world. There's a much bigger domain approaching where you need dynamic elements in the system. And safety organization brings these dynamic elements in, into the system. Now, the first dynamic elements that we have brought into the system is that we can dynamically change the time triggered schedule on the fly, as I said, within a few milliseconds, and adapt the system to evolving application scenarios but still guarantee deadlines. So we, we guarantee the deadlines despite this dynamic. Of course, it could happen that if there's a request for a dynamic reorganization which goes beyond the system's capability, then we say we cannot do it. But then you know we cannot do it. We don't say we can do it and then we don't do it. The second element of safe organization, which goes a little bit in that direction, is that we're looking at transient fault management. We feel most faults in systems nowadays are transient. They're not permanent, they're transient. I'm sure you have a similar experience that transient faults are the ones which, which worry us. And in the TTA, I have now a PhD student working on the problem of robustness. And in the TTA, we want to combine the notion of ground state monitoring, which I explained, and resilience. And resilience is a concept which relates to to handling input failures. That in, 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 for example, in a multimedia system, you can handle some pixel failures without you caring about. So if you build the systems which is resilient to input, which can survive a certain amount, the number of input failures, and you combine it with the concept of fast restart recovery, then you can build very robust systems because if something goes wrong, you realize it for monitoring the state. And sometimes it can be the, the trivial case is that the system just crashes. You know, it doesn't do anything. This you realize immediately because the state is time triggered and you know. And then you force the system in a restart with a proper state. And if it's resilient, of, the users are resilient, you can provide a, even reasonable services over, over this time period. This is particularly important in control systems. In multimedia systems where you can say I can freeze a picture for, for a millisecond for, for, for one frame or so on and, and then you don't care and then you're up again. So I think we can increase the robustness very much by, by this uh, combination. The next step in safe organization is that you introduce a meta model and that you really re-adapt the environment as uh, so your system based on, on the things. And you need it, first of all, when you have permanent faults. Now, permanent faults in our system on chip, we do have considered, we have introduced a, a naming structure for messages that distinguishes two levels, the, the logical level and the physical level. And the physical level is completely independent from the logical level so that we can reconfigure the components, the, 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 the software jobs, as we call them, to different IP cores without having to change the logical naming structure and, and only the physical naming has to be reconfigured. So that's the first level of, of of re reconfiguration and safe organization. Now the next level of introducing a higher level structure with plans and reorganization we haven't touched. Um, uh, I mean a, a scientific advisory board of a, of a group which, which is involved in that, but as I said, it's not my, our, our research objective, so I couldn't go further than that. But I think it's one, some very important issue in the future. Um, we're very aware of that. But again, safe organization and, and robustness is very much related to a clean modular structure of the system with clean interfaces, with clean restart states. And I think with our time period architecture, we go already a step in providing this. And, and then you can put it on top of that. I don't think that you can build safe organizing system if you have a spaghetti kind of architecture. Further questions? Um, how do you actually support the engineers in designing a TT architecture in terms of architectural style and the property match? So that actually these pieces are really fitting together and the components they actually designing make up TT architecture? Well, thank you for the question. That's a very good question. We have been involved in a, in a, in a major European project in the last three years, DECOS, called Dependable Component and Systems. And 
in this project, particularly this issue has been addressed. How to develop a tool environment and, and in, in order to, to implement the systems. May I shortly summarize, and there are a number of groups have been involved. It was a big project, it was about 15 million euro project. It's an IP, yes. And, and there were some academic and industrial institutions, and particularly the Technical University of Budapest has done quite a bit of work on the, on the, on the design flow. Now, the idea on the design flow is that we would like to have a PIM, a platform independent model, and a platform specific model, which is then generated with, uh, with the tools from the platform independent model. Now, on the PIM level, we used as a specification technique in, in the course the ESTAREL technologies, the, 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 the synchronous languages, but also you can use system C. And also another group used MATLAB Simulink. And the, the idea is to develop out of this specification representation by tool support the code for the object architecture. And of course you need, in this context, you need the scheduling tools for, for all this, and the TT Tech has developed a complete suit of tools, the TT Plan and TT Configure and TT View, which are being used by the automotive industry quite extensively now in, in the design of the FlexRay systems. So there's a complete tool environment there, which is integrated in this, this, this Techos project. And of course, there's always more to be done, but there's already quite a bit of tool support available for the time period architecture. And it did take it, it's one of the products they're focusing in the business on. I was amazed in the, in the Genesis project that I didn't expect this, that companies like Thales they work on military project on, on safety critical systems in the aerospace, and Nokia that work on mobile phones would agree on a common, on a, on a common formalism well, for, for, for this higher level specification is UML MATE. Of course the UML is the problem, there's no clean semantics behind it. And, and then, I don't know if you know the PIP uh, semantics from, from Sifaki, Sinclair Nobel. We, we, they developed a, a state machine kind of modeling and they're trying to augment this, this UML with, with PIP. This is one route which is going. But at least the framework, they use the same one, which is more than I expected because I thought that the, the, these people in these different domains would use completely different uh, frameworks to, to specify their problems. It's not the case. It, there is more and more convergence, which I see a, cross domains, and in that sense, Genesis makes a lot of sense to bring this together from the architectural point of view. Originally, when we started out, they said we are too ambitious, we shouldn't even start. But you have to be ambitious. So just know that some of the uh, telecommunication people specify a lot of their programs in T and STL. For example, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Nokia did that. So they switch actually to this new modeling language that has been developed in DECOS. Or is it very similar to what they've been doing? Just yeah, it's modeling, uh, some, uh, the modeling of telecommunication protocols was not an issue. In, 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 it was more in the, in the real-time domain. This, this was, Tecos was strictly in real-time. There was uh, as a control, automotive, and aerospace were involved. As a process control, automotive, and aerospace, but not the, the effect that Nokia is coming in only happened now in Genesis. It wasn't in, in Tecos. Any further questions? Yes, please. Um, uh, in your previous lecture, uh, you, you define a cycle concept. Uh, so I would like to know how many, uh, uh, so how many cycles in your system? You only have one or you have many? So it's, that's a very good question. I didn't go into it, but it's a very relevant question because normally you have many different cycles in the system. You, you don't want all, all the, 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 the processes to work with the same cycles. That's why we introduced in TT Ethernet and also in the TT SSC project the rule that we can support, I don't know, a, a number of cycles which are always a binary 
fraction of the second, or a multiple of the second, normally it's a fraction of the second. So you can have one process that operates, for example, at 10 to the minus, I don't know, 10 or 12 a second cycle, and the other one 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 4. And the, the fact that the cycles are in a harmonic relationship, of course, makes the scheduling problem a lot easier. Because it's very easy, two cycles always give the next bigger cycle. And otherwise, we couldn't do this fast dynamic reconfiguration. The fast dynamic reconfiguration is only possible because we have this rule of harmonic cycles. But we can have cycles, I think in the, in the TTSOC project, the difference between the fastest and the slowest cycle is, is 2 to the power of 8 or something. So it's, it's very substantial, 2 to the 10. It's, it's implementation specific, but so we can have very different cycles in the same system, and this is absolutely necessary. It's absolutely necessary. Well, all every cycle is defined by its period and phase. Period meaning the duration of the cycle, and phase meaning the offset of the cycle start from the time standard. And the scheduler determines the period and the phase of the cycle. I mean, a, a process can, can come and say, I would like to have this bandwidth, for example, if it's event triggered messages, which you want to send over, over the time triggered system, then you would come and say, I would like to have this latency and this bandwidth, and then the scheduler would, would find the cycle and the offset which, to meet this requirement. But it's a very good question because this is a very, we did, for example, TTP and Flexray don't support these multiple cycles. And it's one of the big insights we gained after doing a lot of work that we need multiple cycles and, and they have to be rescheduled very quickly. That, that's where TTE is and it excels TTP and Flexray. That supports these multiple cycles very easily. And another thing of TTE is that, is that we, we support the fate sharing principle of the internet. That we do not keep, well, for normal systems, we don't keep state in the switch. Only for safety critical systems, we have to keep state in the switch in order to make the switch uh, resistant also to failures and can recover very quickly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.